uh, we have Mary Lou Belli, and we are just going to jump right in, Mary Lou, because I have a lot to get through in a half hour. People want to know some things from you. From an oh. Emmy Award winning and again nominated comedy director. So let's start with one of the hard ones that's going to be a little tough to talk about on uh, without visuals. But something that people struggle with the most is blocking, especially when we're talking about something like sitcoms, where you've got the three cameras and it kind of works like a play. Is there something that you mostly tell people to think about when it comes to blocking yeah. actors? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, a, a, a sitcom directing legend, Will McKenzie, was one of the first uh, directors I was working on a show with where I was working with the teens on the show. And I remember him having a little podium and while we would block, he would literally move his podium, which was on uh, casters, to where he thought he was going to line up his shot. And he did this all during the first three days of rehearsal. So he was really, really looking at it from, you know, that perspective of what the camera might see. But I will tell you, Jen, I think blocking for multi-camera comedy is one of the easiest things on the planet to do because you're, you're for the most part, um, if we're doing it in a very, very standard kind of sitcom traditional way, it is the palette's only 180 degrees and, and it's kind of almost formulaic. Your two outside cameras are usually shooting your close-ups because from a, um, camera perspective, it has the best eye lines and therefore, you know, the, the closer you get to a person's actual eye line when you're filming their close-ups, the more you feel like that you're inside their point of view and their soul. So you're always using these cameras because they can get as far into the set as possible. And then your middle two cameras, because it's usually almost always four, you know, one's usually getting, you know, if there's two, a two shot and one of them's going to get your master. And if you don't need the master the whole time, it might be doing what we call an on-camera um uh, or off camera uh, uh, move in terms of it might hold the master and then go into something, some other kind of coverage. But those two center cameras, and you know, they're cameras. They're not on tripods. They move. They're either on dollies or on peds or pedestals, and they and they can go wherever you need them. Um, but but this close up thing and. Uh, is the most important thing. And if you really want to have a much more sophisticated kind of look um, in terms of your close up, you will try to make the um, focal length behind of the cameras nearly the same so that the um, so that they just have the same look because then they have the same feel. And I was taught this by, you know, a, a, a wonderful um cameraman, I think I worked with him on Girlfriends. I think we called him Big Al. No, Big Ed. Big Ed. Um, and he once said, you know, you have these cameras at the other edge of, edge of the stage, but, you know, the focal length is very different between this one and this one. You should use this one and move it in so that it's the same, you know, aspect ratio behind their, behind their, um, behind their heads. And the depth of field is the same. So, you know, that's that's a much more sophisticated way of looking at it um, and shows that go back as far as like home improvement would use a jib regularly to get inside the set a little bit more and follow people around um, on Miss Pat uh, for every episode. I have a choice between or the director directing has a choice between either using a steady cam or a jib. Um, depending on what's going to tell the story for that particular episode the best. And I've used both uh, quite effectively. So, um, uh, you know, that's just a, a, an extra kind of uh, piece of equipment that can add to the storytelling. When you're doing your close-ups, so let's say you have a person, uh, a scene with four people. Yeah. Um, how it gets complicated when you're talking about blocking and people are moving, but, but let's assume they're all just kind of standing or sitting in the same section. Do you have a method for who you do first? Like, do you do the big, biggest yeah. star first? Usually, usually it goes by call sheet order, but I'll give you a, an exception to the rule on friends, which I did not direct, but I had many friends, including one of my mentors, Michael Lembeck directed the rule on that show was if Lise Kudrow's, whether she spoke or not in a scene, she always had to be in your first pass coverage. 
And your first pass coverage is one, you know, that the audience sees for the first time. And that was because they wanted an, a fresh take on um, Lisa's reaction shots. Um, because in many ways, they could extend the length of a laugh by sometimes it's called a laugh on a laugh. So it might not have, she might not have been, let's say it was a, a chance for Monica scene. You have, um, uh, close up on them because it was, you know, you're bobbing heads back and forth for their dialogue. But, and you'd probably have a master saying, oh, there's actually three people in the room, but, or maybe there were four or five or all, all of the friends, but you would often add that extra close up for Lisa for a, for her reaction shots. So that's, you know, that was an exception, but usually it's, you know, um, and I don't, it might not be who's necessarily one and two on the call sheet, but it's almost always, um, where's your story? And it doesn't have to stay the same the entire episode. You know, you know, you can do some lovely, elegant shots with, you know, a close up becoming somebody else's close up. Um, so you're, you're usually not changing, you know, the size of the frame too much. Um, but that's, you know, what's the story you want the audience to see first? Because that first reaction and that capturing of the laughter, which is nearly always live when there's a studio audience, is is a really important thing. Um, and then, you know, you're going to pick up the other stuff in your second pass coverage, which is basically, you know, if it's if you have four things recording the story, then it becomes eight. This isn't complicated at all. This is... <laughs> I'll tell you why it's not complicated. It's because um, you follow the dialogue. Uh, the dialogue. And, Mo, and yeah, it's, it's, it's outside, outside close-ups, inside um, looser coverage. That makes sense. And uh, Monique says, I love the idea of maintaining a reaction shot on the funniest reactor to extend the laugh. And, uh, and John Curtis, who is an actor, totally Monique, fascinating. And I was going to point that out to actors before we move on. Actors who are listening, stop wanting all the lines because we need those reaction shots. We need the coverage. And why not? I used to do, when I was an actor a million years ago, I used to get on screen way more when my mouth was shut. <laughs> well, and also, uh, Jen, you can't ever underestimate the, um, the value of someone who is setting up the punchline. Mm -hmm. because uh, that's gold, especially in an audition when they see that this person will just, it's feed them, feed them, feed them. And especially if you're feeding number one on the call sheet, you know, if their name is in the title of the show even, and, you know, they can, they can just, you know, be the um, uh, George Burns to the Gracie Allens, for those of you, that's comedy history <laughs> you know they were a duo and and so many of the the comedy duos was the person who was the straight man you know the smothers brothers had it in their musical act there were so many who someone's setting it up someone's just zinging out the bunch lines but the setup guy or the setup woman or setup actor is invaluable uh you directed my remember correctly you directed raven's home I did. I did. I so uh, I think Raven is one of the most underrated actresses. She is one of the funniest people on the not planet. Not underrated to those of us in comedy. She uh, is absolutely I love not her so as much. Brilliant. Yeah. And so and, and I think that she's a perfect example of what we're talking about where she's either making us die laughing because of her reaction or her setup or, you know, one of the kids, I don't remember her, I don't remember her real name, but the littlest kid on the new Ravens, she's just a dynamo. And she I is. feel like anybody who's studying comedy, I really encourage them to watch Raven's Home because they get in their heads a kid's show. And I'm like, no, it's genuinely so hilarious. And you can really see how the mechanics work when you watch that show. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and that little girl is very, very much present in the uh uh in the last few episodes and she is gifted. She really um, I did a bit in the episode I directed, which I, I, you know, I went, she was having a, a scene with her older brother and I went, okay, so how am I going to make this funny? Because it, you know, sometimes when you're shooting two skilled people, and in this case, it was two skilled comedic actors, um, uh, you want that two shot. But the height difference was so extreme. Oh, yeah. So at some point, 
and it was very early on the scene, I, it was in the living room. I said, lift her up and put her on the coffee table so I could get the two shot. And <laughs> she was, so they, they were the same, uh, they, so they were eye level. And it, it got a la the, the lifting up got a laugh. And then the close-ups worked better for the, and then I was able to also just utilize the two shots so easily, um, which when, and, and this is also a secret you should know, when you uh, are in a position where the comic timing of the actors you're working with is not pristine, like it was with, um, uh, unlike what, what it was in this, those guys were just perfect. But when it's not, as a director, you can control the comic timing in your edit mm -hmm. if you have wonderful clean close-ups so um if if you're saying oh it's off just a hair make sure you get the close-ups so that you can you know again you can be in charge of the timing oh, yes. and sometimes yes. that timing is just shaving off frames or adding frames totally i think editors save our asses all the time <laughs> all the time um, I want to remind everybody who's watching, uh, you guys are very quiet. We, we're already halfway through, if you can believe it or not. So get your questions in now because you're not going to get a lot of time at the end. I want to move into, since we're already kind of talking about framing the comedy to get the joke, let's talk about finding the jokes in the material. Yeah. I, I always, I'm more of a drama director, so I do direct more drama, but I love comedy, especially when you do draw a lot of drama and you're just depressed on set all the time. It's so nice to laugh. Uh, one of the things I think that I might struggle with is really finding those moments. If my if my actors aren't finding the beats, how can I help bring those comedy beats out? What am I looking for? Well, listen, this is where there's a couple things I'm going to say. The first thing is studying the show and the episodes that have come probably before yours, unless you're the pilot director. If you do that, I often reference moments I've seen them do before and go, oh, you know, it's like, and, and then I'll go. So um, another ch little cheat is if I have not been able to explain the cadence of a, of a, of a uh, line and I, I avoid line readings, I will very often paraphrase the line with the cadence I want. It's just a little cheat. Um, and it's not line giving a line reading, but it can help them um, hear it. Um, and then I think the most important though part is though creating an atmosphere in which your actors can play. Because I have to tell you, um, when actors are loose and they feel free to fail, especially in a rehearsal, they will try things. And 90% of my good ideas come from being watchful and going, oh, they had that impulse, but they didn't go with it. And all I have to do is create that energy where they'll go, oh yeah, I did that. And, and, and then they'll really go full force and, 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 and execute their impulse in, a, in, in that safe environment. And then you get magic out of them. So, um, you know, and, and it goes back to casting well. <laughs> you, know, you can't underestimate. Casting well does help. Um, so, so those are little tricks. I don't know if that's that hits on what you were trying oh, to get. It's great. And oh, thank you, Tracy. Tracy says, Makai Michelle played at, plays Alice on Raven's Home. Thank, thank you. you. She yes. needed, her name needs to be shouted out. I want her for future things I direct. Oh, um, so... When I was in the I have to say there's an alter ego that the writers have given her in terms of the little um doll she has, which also is a a brilliant idea, but also a fabulous arena for creating stuff. And and shout out to the prop masters on that show for, you know, like sometimes mimicking the outfit she's wearing, you know, down to sunglasses and the prop. So it's not just costumes, it's props also that are like saying, oh my God. She's wearing glasses. Let's put a glasses on the little doll. So it's there's lots of fabulous. Um, I love that to explore there. I love that. Uh, when you so when I was in theater a million years ago, uh, studying theater, it was the big thing was like the rules of three in comedy. But Absolutely. I feel like comedy has changed over the years. Do you feel like there's still a rule of three? Oh my gosh, yes. Now that has has expanded 
So that I always say, look for any patterns of three, you know, we call them runs, R-U-N-S, or runs of three. But in terms of that, the, um, they might come in, they might come as a playing list. Um, I went to get apples, uh, uh, bananas, and pomegranates. You know, the third thing is always the funny thing. And it might be a little list, but it also might be in, in patterns of lines. So it might be, I say something, you say something. That's one. I say something, you say something, two. I say something, you say the punchline, three. Or it might be as simple as I say something, one. You say something, two. I hit the punchline, three. So there's very, very um, different ways that pattern shows up. Um, it might be the mentioning of three things, which is a callback net technically, where I might mention something specific a pomegranate, then somebody else mentions a pomegranate, and then I get the third time for the pomegranate. And again, we're always looking for the third thing in the uh, pattern of three to be the funny thing. And and mm. it still holds. That now, if you want to talk about a more sophisticated kind of joke, although I find that pretty sophisticated, um, the pro probably the most in terms of writing is what we call the mislead turn. There are other comedy teachers who have other names for it. Scott Sedita, I think calls it a turnaround or a reversal. And then, but, but those are the three common, a, a mislead turn, a reversal um, or a turnaround. Um, but it's always mentioning information, totally misleading the audience to say, we're going in this direction and then reversing it and then surprising them. Element of surprise being a, a specific a set, essential element to comedy. Um, and mentioning that third thing. Those, you know, if you want to watch great writing and great mislead terms, you know, girlfriends had them galore, but also um, Frasier. Frasier, you know, it was, Kelsey can still plop those in just beautifully. Uh, when you're breaking down your scripts and you're prepping for an episode, do you go through and go, I'm, find, I'm finding all these jokes uh, before I get to set, even though you know you're going to probably build on them with the actors. Yeah, yeah. and you know, when I teach comedy directing um, and acting, um, I, I, I've I been using a scene from Girlfriends for literally 10 years in my teaching because I've never found a, a page in three A's that has every single kind of joke that ever occurs in the sitcom within a page in three A's. And it's just chock full. So I'm always... Um, when I'm teaching that, I'm teaching, you know, what kind of jokes occur and and little clues that you'll see. And, and here's the first one I always say, look at punctuation and then look at the line, the word before it or the words before it and see if it feels like a punchline. If, or if it's got, I mean, you can do something as simple as, does it have one of the plosives in it? You know, because that rule that K's and P's are funny, but it's also all the plosives, B, C, D, G, when it sounds like G, K, C, when it sounds like K, because it's really a K sound, K, P, Q, T, and X, when it sounds like a KS sound. Um, so it's, you're, you're looking for words and you just go, it has one of those plosives in it. This might be a punchline. Um, you're looking for stage directions that might say, oh, they put a stage direction just before the punchline. Well, not only are they saying it's the punchline, but the writers are also saying, and this is how we want it delivered. So there's all sorts of, of I, I call that scene a treasure map because you can, if you study it and analyze it and find the clues that will always identify the jokes. So I always go through that. And not only do I do that, Jen, but I block the entire scene, the, the entire show. Wow. I block the actor so I know the way, a way that I know it will be funny and I come prepared that way. Now, do I adhere to that exact? No, but by doing that and studying things, for example, you remember I said having two people next to each other um, uh, in a two shot for the comedy when they really are excellent comedians. Well, it might be that if there's three people in the scene, I'm going to put those two people together. I'm going to put them um, so that I have that two shot. Um, especially if I have people sitting at a table, I'm, I'm sometimes doing that, you know, three, four, five different ways on paper to go, okay, this, 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 this. And I'm, so I'm thinking shots through even so that 
when I get there, and trust me, I there's very few actors, including Raven, who doesn't like to say, to be told or suggested to when they come in the scene, um, where do you want me to enter? I have an answer. You know, come come from upstairs because she'll be on this side of the thing. You'll come down and you'll be on the opposite side of the island. You know, I've thought that through. Um, and again, if she goes, yeah, but I really think, and I go, okay. And then I might find a way, props are your friends, to get, let's say this the, the uh, daughter was on the other side or one of her kids is on the other side. And, oh, well, just have her cross the island to the other side so that she's still on the opposite side of Raven. But I've motivated a cross to the other side because she had to go retrieve a prop, whether it was scripted or not, but it feels, and this goes back, you wanna study great blocking that is inspired by props in the room, watch the old Rodas. I literally, I used to teach when I taught my, my sitcom com, um, directing class at USC, we would watch Rota scenes and study because you just go, oh, what? God, they're constantly moving and it feels so active and kinetic. And, you know, you just go, they would go for the jokes. They wouldn't move on the punchlines. But the moment that the punchline was over, you'd see them go across the room. Sometimes it was for Rota to take off a coat or get something from the refrigerator. You know, those, those sort of um, organic blocking things that make people feel like they're living in the space as opposed to standing still. Right. It's, it's, it's just, you know, adds to the character. I watch, um, when I watch sitcoms, especially like the Connors, because they use a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, especially in the kitchen. I'm always wondering how, you know, like how much of that is used as motivation and how much is just like, it's kind of like theater. So you've got to have things going on or, or do you only ever use it as motivation? No, no. Sometimes it's just, it's, it's real life going on, but also what you'll notice on, in shows like that, and, and I will tell you, I go into a set for the first time and sometimes before I start directing a show, and especially in the kitchen, the first thing I do is open the cabinet doors to see if they're stocked. Is there stuff? Is, the, is there silver in the silverware drawer? Is there, there's almost always food in the refrigerator. But, you know, um, is the, the cabinet next to the sink, you know, does, have they ever used the sink with real running water? you know, which is just a special effects thing. It's not hard to do, but, you know, um, sound hates it <laughs> if you run the water. But other than that, I'm always looking to think. And then with notice, unless it's a, is it a door that is sealed shut or doesn't really have shelves in it, if you would open that door, then you're adding to the budget right, of, of the show by, but you do, they go almost every other kit, every kitchen I've come in, in into, on a sitcom, there has been one cabinet you can open. And they go, you know, we don't have that one, but you know, the one, the two, the, the, the two doors down, that one opens. And that's where we usually put the dishes. Do you work with props beforehand to, to make sure, like I, cause I can imagine it's a nightmare for them if you're just in there grabbing and moving and. Yeah, but, but you know, listen, I had a prop master on the Hughleys who had been an actor first. He, I mean, he had done stuff like at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. He was a serious actor. And he was also a guy that when the studio was too cheap to hire actors for a five-day rehearsal, he would fill in and do, you know, just walk through the other, other parts that sometimes your ADs were willing to do as well until they, the hired actor was, you know, on the clock. Um, but because he was an actor, the way he provided props for the actress was so organic. You know, he thought of, if I was playing this character, what would I want? What would I, what things I might I use rehearsal? And they would show up at the first rehearsal on set. You're gonna bake cookies? Well, you know what? There's measuring cups, there's measuring spoons, there's, there's a mixing bowl, there's a scraper, there's a mix master, it's plugged in. It, you know, you just go, he thought of everything. I love it. Yeah. All right. We have a few minutes. So I'm going to jump into all the questions that are coming in, guys. So let's go. We have FG says, how long do you work on one episode of sitcom TV? Is it one week prep, one week rehearsals, one week no. night shooting? For, for multi-camera sitcom, there, um, you might have a pre-production meeting, but um, that production meeting is usually uh, possibly just before the table read. So you have five days. 
Um, and I've also, Tyler Perry has has a formula where he does them in less, but I've done, in, done them in four days. I've done them in five days. Um, on a single camera, it's um, there's a prep and then a shoot. So that's different. So you literally come in on a Monday and they're shooting on a Friday type of thing? Exactly. That's great. And Love hopefully it. I've had the, and very often if it's a Monday through Friday show, they've handed the actors and the director gets the, um, next script right after they finished the taping. So I have it on Saturday and Sunday usually. That's great. Uh, Asha says, have you ever experienced working with an actor that performed better without a planned prep for a scene or a prop amplified their performance? Who, 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 oh, yeah, without a planned prop. Who, 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 actor that performed better without a planned prop for a scene. So well, I guess they just decided to pick well, something up and go for it. That hasn't been my experience. Um, and I'll and I'll give you an example. And this goes back to one of my first experiences. Um, uh, before Sean Astin, there was a very famous sitcom guy who played Gomez in the original Adams Family named John Astin. John Astin came in and did a episode of Charles in Charge where he had a he was playing some kind of sort of possibly traveling salesman. But he had a little prop that he had to unpack and then pack up. Um, he, we were rehearsing the scene just before lunch. He said to the prop master, and then we had to break, but, and we were planning on coming back to him. He said, could I stay through lunch? Would you mind if I use this stuff? He said, you know, I'll be very careful. And the prop master said, sure, I mean, it was John Haston. And um, he must, I stayed during lunch to watch him. He probably did the physical activity of that scene 30 times during his lunch break. And when we came back, it was flawless. And if you had had him do a second take or a second rehearsal of that scene, it would have, he would have touched the bo every bottle or every object that he had taken out of his, this prop and put back in exactly the same way with the exact same hand on the exact same line. So I have found, and, 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 you know, another example of this is um, uh, the guy who played Kramer, Michael Richards on Seinfeld for every entrance he did at Kramer, he probably spent, I'm not exaggerating because I know this to be a fact. Six to seven hours. So you know how we bumped in to the walls or the door or whatever? That was not an accident. That was not improvisational. That was worked out as any, and he, he loved this term if you called him that, any clown would work out their bits. That is amazing. I hope the actors listening are paying attention. And uh, that sounds like an editor's dream as well. How many times you've been in the editing bay and you're like, actor, can you please use the same hand at least? Yeah. Uh, next question. Atlanta filmmaker, does improvising help? And how do you work with actors who only want to improvise and not memorize lines? You know what? You know that that's their gift. Because if, you know, uh, you know, listen, there may be ones who are just lazy, but sometimes they're lazy because they know that their gift is in the other direction. And that's when you um, uh, don't cut too soon. Um, think how you, you can cut around to the good stuff, to the gold that they're delivering improvisationally and um, and know that you have something special there. So it's 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 not a bad thing. It's a good thing. How do you well, cover that if you're if you're on a sitcom and there and there's a lot of improvising and now you have to like edit and leave. do what just because of all the cameras you just figure you got it cameras on it multiple sizes and you keep it clean as opposed to an over the shoulder mm. try to get them clean because then you don't have to worry about matching so smart yeah. uh, Mo Monique and Marquita are asking if there's if you could share the girlfriend scene or tell them which scene it is they really want to see it uh, oh gosh which one was I talking about. Um, the one you always use in class, the comedy gold. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's what, you know what? Can I get back to you? Do you? Yes. Want I okay. will, I will ping everybody in the, in the black magic group and in working director group. Yeah, whenever, yeah, I can tell you because I know, I know exactly. I think it's, it might be something from Stark raving mad and I can't, but I'll, I, I think I, the title's on the script so I can look it up. Uh, Karen Ruby, who is a script supervisor. Uh, wants to know how often do you rely on script supervisors when you're coming in to oh shoot your show the first time? They're my best friend. They're my best friend. And literally, I used to be invited to a lunch that a lot of script supervisors had. I, I felt an honor to be amongst them. They're smart. They're, you know, they make, they often make really great directors. 
Um, uh, one of them from Girlfriends, one Esther Holmes, has been directing up a storm and been asked back on nearly every ep show she's done since she's moved from script supervising and directing. Um, listen, they have the, the gift of being on set all the time, hearing the hearing the rhythms of comedies, very often working with actors and sometimes running lines with them if they need it. Um, plus, they're also watching the blocking and the camera blocking. They've had these tools if it's something they want to do at their um, at their fingertips. So it's it's a natural feeder pond if 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 that's not derogatory, you know. To but they're they're amazing. I love them. This has been so good. We are out of time, y'all. I want to throw some of these compliments going up to you, though. Uh, Shilpi, who has also directed Raven's Home. Yes. Uh, she, she said, great tip on Rhoda. Uh, we've got Tomika. This is so good. Everybody's just loving it. Um, I want to thank you so much. I will uh, continue to share with you guys. Um, they're still coming in. I'm sorry. I'm getting distracted by all the questions and the good and the happiness everybody's got. Uh, just thank you so much, Mary Lou. We will send everybody the girlfriends episode through the channels. And um, until then, good, you know, good luck, break a leg. What do we say for the Emmys? Uh, you got this. <laughs> Here's what I'd like. The nomination is the win. And I, and I mean, that's let's say nominees because I feel honored to be in their presence. Well, and honestly, I think everybody on here feels like just the fact that you're directing shows you love is the win. So I think you're living, a, you're, you're doing well. You're doing okay. Jen, thank you for having me. And thank you for doing this in terms of your service to our community and, and, and sharing your knowledge and such great questions so that, you know, we can all learn. And I learn every day, guys. So thanks. Thank you. Okay.